Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, I am going to ask all participants to please make sure you're muted and make sure that your videos are off, including the actors, until it's time to turn yourselves on. Thank you, thank you. Um, so the, some, of, some of you that were here early noticed we did have some unwelcome uh, visitors for the uh, performance today. Um, I'm kind of honored because we hadn't been Zoom bombed yet, but um, it finally happened and I'm glad that it happened before the performance. If it does happen during the performance, um, I will be, we will uh, take a pause and I will get rid of our unwanted audience members. But of course you are all wanted and we're very happy that you're here. Um, this is the first time that Zoom has required a waiting room. So it's taking me a couple of minutes to get everyone entered, but it looks like everyone's here now. Here we go. And so we'll get started and hope for the best. Thank you all for being here today and thank you for joining us an hour early. Um, we're starting an hour early because uh, Yom Kippur, for those that are observing, uh, starts at 6.25 p.m. It's already a little after five on the East Coast. Uh, so we wanted to start early out of respect. If you are observing Yom Kippur, I hope that you have an easy fast. Uh, for those that are joining us for the first time, um, this is our, I think either our fifth or our sixth edition of the Almost Adults LGBTQ plus online short play reading series. My name is Aaron Levitman. I'm the producer and host for the event. Um, for those that were unable to join us today, um, you are uh, able to watch all the videos for the Almost Adults reading series on our Facebook page, which you can find by searching under Almost Adults Theater. We are being live streamed currently on that page. If you uh, are adverse to Facebook, you can also watch these videos on our new YouTube channel, which you can search by searching under Almost Adults and then my name, Aaron Levinman, and it should come up. Um, and we are getting a whole new audience watching our video, so we're really excited about that. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank those that have continued to support us over the years, I'm sorry, the years, over the few months, it feels like years, over the last few months, including Theater Santa Fe, uh, the Unitarian Universalists of Santa Fe, uh, Rose Pravon and the Theater Lovers Club, uh, Broadway World, um, And uh, all of you that have continued to share our Facebook posts and my emails, um, that is how an event like this gets off the ground. So thank you all for, for being here and for spreading the word. Um, there is gonna be a talk back after today's performance with at least most of the playwrights, I believe they're all here. And also with the actors and directors who are able to stay on and join us for the Q and A. Um, I will be announcing next uh, events program at the end of the reading today. Uh, the uh, three plays, the total running time is about 40 minutes and there'll be a talk back, as I said. Um, so the next event is gonna be October 11th and that's going to be starting at our regular time, which is 4 p.m. Mountain Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time and everything else in between. So we hope to see you on October 11th. Again, I'll be announcing the program after the fact today. With that, we're going to get started. Um, we will see you after the after the plays. Thank you again for being here. Brian's Poems, a 10 minute play by Larry Wrinkle, directed by Matt Cogswell. Cast of characters, the old man, played by Stephen Oakey, the librarian, played by Danette Sills, and Brian, 
played by Guy Dunphy. Brian is the ghost of a man who died at 36, but who looks like the boy of 17 that the old man remembers. Setting, the main reference desk at the Sal Palu Library. Time, a Friday afternoon, 4.50 p.m. At rise, the librarian is seated at her desk. Oh, oh, thank God, what I went through to get here. We close in 10 minutes. No, 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 that's, that's impossible. You're supposed to be open until nine. 5 p.m. on Fridays. Oh, shit. Shh. No shit. How, how did I get this wrong? What, what about tomorrow morning? Closed, holiday recess. Damn. Shh. Senor, this is a library. Look. This is very important. There's a book I need, and you are one of only two libraries in the world that has it. And my plane is tomorrow at noon, so if I can't find it today... Nine and one half minutes. You see, the other library is in Stanford, California, where they only give access to academics. So after thinking of this for like the past 13 years, when I first learned of this book's existence on the internet, I finally decided I, I take the plunge and, and now you're telling me I only have nine and a half, no, no, nine minutes and 20 seconds to find the book and read it. But senor, the library stacks are like a gigantic intricate maze where people have been lost for six or seven hours by merely taking a wrong turn. And at best you would need nine minutes, 42 seconds, simply to find this book. And then how could you read it? We must clear all the rooms five minutes before we close. Then I'll run. Not in the library. I just want to photograph the book on my phone. Three, four minutes tops. But that would violate copyright. And you cannot do an entire book in three, four minutes. 48 pages. I click fast. And it's a book of poems, a master's thesis by a high school classmate of mine, Brian Klinkowski, who is now dead. Most unfortunate, senor. You may return Monday at 8.30. But, but what would I do here all weekend? My plane to Columbus, Ohio leaves on tomorrow. Surely you can be a little flexible? Loser. What? I said, I am sorry, you may return Monday. No, no, you called me a loser. No, I called you a loser, asshole. No, now you're calling me an asshole? Senor, you are the only one who is using that word. We do not tolerate the word asshole in the University of Sao Paulo Library. I know what you just called me. No, senor, I did not. No, I did. Also, a fuck up. You've been a fuck up since the day you were born. Probably earlier. Can't even get to a library in time to look up the only copy of my book, except the one in Stanford you can't look up either. The, the plane was delayed. Three hours and then customs and baggage and the traffic. Excuses, excuses. Brian? Eight minutes. And who is Brian? What are you doing in Sao Paulo? You're dead. And, and, and you, don't shush me. Of course I'm dead. I'm keeping my book company. I, I figured you'd turn up sooner or later. But you're still 17. You wouldn't want to see me at 36. Senor, I do try to maintain my appearance, but I'm somewhat older than 17, and flattery will not persuade me to keep the library open. Not you. I met Brian. Senor, there is no Brian here. Yes, yes there, there is. is. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is not. Seven minutes, 15 seconds. Can I at least explain? Good luck with that. Good luck with that. You see, Senora, uh, 
Gamboa, is it? Have you ever been in love? Senor, I am a librarian. Seven minutes. I can tell time. Mm, you sure about that? I am so going to ignore you. First you want to explain, then you want to ignore. Senor, you are not making sense. It's complicated. Not really. This is not something I tell many people. In fact, it's rather embarrassing. Then perhaps you should consult a psychiatrist with all these hallucinations. <laughs> now that's a fantastic idea. Shut up. Oh, not, not you. <laughs> but just so you understand how urgent this is to me. Well, you see, 45 years ago, back in the 10th grade, I had the most intense crush on Brian. Oh, that's so sweet. But why are you telling a librarian? Because the only evidence of his existence besides the yearbook picture I always carry and his thesis at Stanford University Library is buried somewhere in this huge bazillion building which I can't get into because I only have Six minutes. See? See? Here's his picture. Hey, come on. I was a babe. The most beautiful person I'd ever seen. Very kind of you, senor, but... <laughs> Wavy blonde hair, blue eyes, rippling muscles. You played the trumpet. He's a star gymnast, a straight-A student, and a poet. Pretty near perfect, wasn't I? Cute little round butt. <laughs> I used to check him out at his tight little gym shorts. Perv. Check him out. Uh, this Brian was a book? No. <laughs> it means... Ogle, stare. Yeah, o ogle and, and stare. <laughs> <laughs> I see. You, senor are a homosexual. Duh. Duh. <laughs> now do you understand? And, and can't you keep the library open just, just 10 more minutes so I can just find this book? No, it is impossible, senor. No, it is impossible, senor. Brian, will you shut up? No Brian here, senor. This means a lot to me. It's all so sad. You had many opportunities previously. I, I'm a procrastinator. It took me all these years to, to work up my courage. And... Senor, if it takes you so much courage merely to visit a library. All right. I, I see there's no persuading you. Heart of stone. Shut up, Brian. Senor, no, Brian. Well, well, thanks anyway. A total waste of time and money. Loser. I am truly sorry, senor, but rules are rules and I must now clear the galleries. Come back Monday and allow yourself at least four hours in case you get lost. Hey, shithead. Third drawer, right side of the desk. The old man opens the desk drawer and finds a thin book. What the fuck? Does the librarian know? Was, was she just jerking me around? And did she read your book too? No. Nobody has even noticed my book since it was deposited here 30 years ago. You're the only idiot stupid enough to look for it without checking the library hours. Well, well how did it get here? Duh. Shit, now I've, I've really got only three or four minutes. I, I, shit, my phone's dead. Moron, forget the phone. Turn to page 21. It's between 20 and 22. To the acolyte? Read, asshole. Brian, 
Now you know. Thank you. I worshipped you. Look where I am now. Dead. At 36. In Ronald Reagan's America. You'll always be 17 to me. Maybe if we had trusted each other. Then maybe, John, we'd both be dead. Right, now put that book in your bag and get out of here before she comes back. But, but won't that set off an alarm? <laughs> I already checked it out. <laughs> you know, ogled, stared. Will I, will I hear from you again? Hey, maybe when you're dead too. But it's not at all cracked up to be. Really boring, never ends. Now get moving. The old man exits, leaving behind a call slip from the book as the librarian returns. Senor, senor, I ran, I checked, I nearly got lost. The book is missing. And now so is the senor. The librarian looks down and sees the call slip. Shh. End of play. Of Kind and Kindness, a short play by Jerome Joseph Gentis, directed by Marty Madden. Cast of characters, Rodrigo, played by Noah Seagard, who is actually Sebastian, a gentleman from Messaline, any race. And Antonio, played by Todd Pavetti, a rugged fisherman type male. The play was inspired by the character of Antonio in Twelfth Night and his interactions with Sebastian in particular. At rise, a beach, somewhere on the Illyrian coast, twilight, the steady sound of waves and the crackle of a fire in its rock pit. Rodrigo is pulling on his damp trousers. His shirt, socks, and boots are drying on an improvised rack made of driftwood and stones. He shivers and coughs from time to time. <coughs> Rodrigo <coughs> enters with a loaf of bread, a meat pie, and a jug of water. An especially severe coughing fit overtakes Rodrigo. Antonio sets everything down and rushes to his side. Awake at last, I'm still quite sick. I must find out what happened to the others who were aboard our craft. You must rather eat. I've stolen, I've purchased some foodstuffs from a nearby farm. The meat pie was baked by the farmer's good wife just this morning. That's kind of you, but I dare no longer, Terry. I do insist again that you lie down and rest. Rodrigo nods and lets Antonio help him lie down. Those breeches aren't dry. You better take them off. I'd rather keep them on. With night coming fast upon us, their chill and wet will sicken you even more. Come, man. We need not be modest in each other's presence. Rodrigo removes his pants and hands them to Antonio, who sets them back to dry. What kind of fisherman did you say you were? A gallant and a proficient, most certain. Why, these waters are as familiar to me as my own home. Kind as a mother's kindness. They are not so to us. Cold am I still. Here, take mine own tunic. Antonio removes his shirt and drapes it over Rodrigo's legs. Uh, now you will be cold. I must needs keep the fire stoked throughout the night to warm thee. Will you not sleep? Antonio pulls his knife from its belt scabbard. Not on this wild and savage coast. He cuts a piece of meat pie for Rodrigo and one for himself. Reports there are of a sea plague of scoundrels on these near shore currents. Where such sailors ply their craft, so too must they find occasional anchor nearby. I'll keep watch o'er me and thee. 
of charity. What shore is this? What sea? Illyrian, both, good friend. That much I know. <coughs> Take thou some water. I want for a pannikin in which to boil it. For it is said that hot water more rapidly flushes ill humors from the body and helps restore the balance therein. Thanks for their pains. <coughs> Doesn't cost me anything. If anything, gazing upon your fair countenance as you recover is its own kind of idol. Rodrigo pulls away, but only slightly. You are too generous. <laughs> Yours is far too handsome a figure to lose to a watery grave, or ague, or vagabonds. Oft have I heard it rumored that sailors do thus rescue others as you have me. <laughs> You're not by trade a seaman. Oh, I'm fit for neither sea nor sail. I'm a landlubber, true. So why were you? See, I was with my tw I was twixt, an old home and another. For I have heard it rumored that across yon wider ocean lies a fairer and freer one still. A land somewhere far to the west so wild and open, many seek its shelter and abundance. Now we will never see it. We? I mean, I, I and... My betters, I, I myself will never make that crossing, for surely they, my crew, and my better self lies beneath these waves. <laughs> now I make my bared skin damp yet again. Fear not, <laughs> for I too have known both love and grief. She was your wife. Not so. <laughs> But a lifelong companion, a most trusted person for my very day of birth. It, I am yet a bachelor. As am I. Hmm. Well, tell me thine own sorrows, that hmm. I might be of help to thee. Uh, well, let me guess, thou art also wise and fair enough to have been the light of someone's eye, and she is the cause. Thinkest me fair? Fair enough for a man. Well, fair enough too, or four. For in a single letter often lies new meaning altogether, as one S makes he into she, and removing two turns woman into man, when spoke for a man and for this man, <laughs> yield vast difference. Woman cannot turn into man, nor would she err. I've heard otherwise, and its opposition that sometimes man and man are as like to each other as man to woman. Indeed. Sometimes more than in mere deed. Antonio makes a pass, but not a crude or rude one. Rodrigo scrambles away as best he can under the conditions. Good Rodrigo, forgive my trespass. I did misread your signals. I assure you, Antonio, if ever I was to follow through on such an impulse, a man like thee is just the sort towards which I'd tend. My inclination, however, bends not in that direction. When port is scarce, a harbor of any kind may do as well. Having spent such time at sea as you did to get to this place, thou art surely not unfamiliar with that notion. I should go. I have burdened thee long enough. You are still unwell. No. Yes. Mayhap you know that the recommended cure for deep interior cold of the bodily sort is to lie not simply by a fire, but with another body, however animal it may be. I cannot. You can, but will not. However your body speaks, your reason divides itself from what you think your baser impulse is. When reason is in fact a cultivated garden of its own and the body, the wild and freer world you seek. I am going now. Whether thou wilt or no. You are not going. 
for still art here. I will not keep thee. Go then, if you are so determined. Know that my offer stands. Fairly well. And you. Rodrigo goes, his footsteps fade into the distance. Antonio looks after him for a long time. The sound of waves, the distant hoot of an owl. Good owl, good ocean, and good night. Once again, you remain my truest companions. Oh, master mine, how thou art ailing. Oh, stay and rest and cease thy sailing. For seas may crest both high and low. Lay thy head and end thy travels. Ere the path you trod unravels. Near is further than you go. Silence, waves, then footsteps. It's Rodrigo. You did not leave anything material behind. Save my debt. I do owe you the greatest thanks for your kindness. In your original and lengthy leave taking did gratitude already achieve most full and deep expression. Yet I can read in thy gaze and lips other words unspoken. My lips move not. Lips and tongues that seldom move oft speak more truth than those that do. The difference between our society grieves mere circumstance. For thou art far more grateful, gentle, and noble than I. You could teach me much, methinks. The ways of fishermen. And other kinds of men. Rodrigo lays his hand against Antonio's cheek. They stand there a moment. Antonio reaches up, takes Rodrigo's hand, and moves it slowly from his cheek downward until it is back against Rodrigo's side. Rodrigo, not because of your fairness and freedom, but because of thy humanity did I pull thee from the briny churn. To a degree earthly philosophers of your knew, every man and woman, each being for that matter, despite his own particular nature can see in any other some degree of likeness. Thus I and you and they and he and we just as humans are said first molded after most godlike shape, living, breathing model, each to each. Most learned in head, rather more in heart. If not so, then at least most worn and well-traveled. Allow me this, that I may know you once, just once, before I go. If, and only if, you do with that openness and willingness you sought afar. Freedom is a remote country, only if you make it so. As you ask, so will I do. They kiss lightly. You tremble still. Aye, but from other cause. Be not afeard, for I am here with thee in kindness. And kind. They kiss lightly again, lights down, the sound of waves, the hoot of an owl, darkness, end of play.
Poloi, written by Rob Salerno, directed by Christopher Thanks. Basile. John, played by John Reeser, and Leo, played by Bryce Townsend. Setting, Chicago, coffee shop. 5.45 p.m. on a Wednesday in February. Leo and John, both about 30, sit at a table. Leo's in mismatched clothes, almost like a child trying on his father's discarded clothes he's found in storage. The backpack is slung on the back of his chair. John's come straight from the office. He's holding a printout of an airline ticket in his hands. Palau. 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 Okay, okay. I know this is kind of a big thing to spring on you. Kind of. Leo, you want me to go with you to Palau? Yes. And you swoop into town and you expect me to drop uh, everything and get on a plane with you to Polynesia. Micronesia. You might be thinking of Tokelau or maybe Tuvalu. Those are in Polynesia. Micronesia is, you know what? I have a Lonely Planet guide in here somewhere. And in three days. Well, tomorrow's Robbie's wedding. Then I figured you need time to pack and maybe buy a swimsuit. Leo. John, come on. What is so crazy about this? What's so crazy. Leo, we haven't seen each other in 10 years. Nine. And before we even get through the small talk, you hand me a one-way ticket and ask me to go to Palau with you because you, you uh, what? You had a dream about us. Leo pulls out an old marked up wall map of the world and spreads it over the two small table. No, no. We had a dream. Um, you remember how we used to talk about backpacking around the world together? Leo, is this the map from the big backpacking trip we were supposed to do after college? Okay, you're right. I shouldn't have rushed the small talk. So how have you been, really? Well, I feel like I can't just go back to small talk now, Leo. Okay, well, look, I feel bad. L let's just take the map and the ticket off the table. Go back like five minutes, start over. John! Oh my God, it's been years, man. What are you doing these days? I mean... I got the cliff notes from Facebook, Mr. Fancy Lawyer, and I saw your picture with Carly Rae Jepsen. Oh, so you really took an interest, huh? I mean, obviously, I read your online profiles. Didn't you look at mine? John's um, phone buzzes. John yes, checks sir. an email while talking. Sorry, one second. Uh, not as much to see of you, but you seem like the same old Leo from high school. Oh, a little heavier, but aren't we all? I mean, except for you. You look... But tell me what you've been up to. Who's your best friend here? John's phone buzzes. Um, who is my best friend? Who has best friends as an adult? I mean, isn't that kind of like asking, so what's your favorite color? Periwinkle. Uh, okay, so I was here, then San Fran, here in London, tried New York, but the whole Manhattan thing was a little... Mm, I've been here again for five years now. I got a place in Lakeview. I um my I keep pretty busy, you know, between work, gym, concerts, stuff like that. So you've never been to Palau. Okay, so good. We're not doing the fake small talk thing anymore. <laughs> well, I mean sort of, but have you ever? Why would I have ever gone to Palau? <laughs> okay, great, great. That's exactly what you'd said in the dream. Oh, cool. So you did have a dream. No, John, I said we had a dream. Maybe you don't remember because sometimes that's what happens when you wake up, but to me, it's clear as day. You and me were snorkeling in a coral lagoon and you told me that this was exactly what you needed. That the night before I gave you the ticket, you'd had a dream about us traveling around the globe together. And I'm really glad we reconnected today, Leo, but I'm fairly certain that I have not had a dream where we run away to Polly, um, Micronesia with a guy that I haven't seen in 10 years and we what build coffee tables together at a driftwood uh, that'd be so cool because they'd be all weather worn but we don't have to do that we don't even have to stay there Palau is just a start step one in the journey of the rest of our lives and that journey may take us right back here or we may wind up in Burkina Faso or Belize or Belarus or Bahrain or Bangladesh I'm stuck on the bees right now but you get my point look look man we're getting older Okay, Robbie's getting married. You've probably got a mortgage. I've got a bad back. We're running out of time to do the things that we always talked about doing when we were kids. So Robbie's out, but if we're smart, we can still have whole lives that are amazing adventures. Hey, Leo, enough. I am sorry that we lost touch, but when I left Minnesota, man, 
I got a life. I am not some flirty gibbet who can just run away to indulge the fantasies of a guy that I see once in a decade. I'm sorry. Hey, I got an early morning look. I should go. I was <laughs> you. That's that's real cool, John. You know, here I thought I was doing something nice for you. You know, that ticket cost me thirty five hundred dollars, and I even got a flight with two stopovers, so no segment was longer than eight hours, which is the maximum recommended length of time to be in a plane, so you don't get a blood clot. You put a lot of thought into this, and you're just insulting me. I appreciate the gesture, man. Really, I do, and I am sorry for calling you a um whatever I said back there, but you have got to understand why I can't just get on a plane with you right now. Why? I mean, let's just break this down for a minute. Do you not like tropical islands? If, if, you, if you'd won that ticket in a lottery or something, wouldn't you go? Well, maybe, but- this Of course you would. <laughs> so why do you think I messaged you about meeting up? I don't know. I, I was just excited about seeing you again. Perfect. I was also kind of sad though, and I was scared that this was going to get weird and it might make the wedding super awkward. <laughs> so you knew I was going to spring expensive plane tickets on you. Okay, honestly, I was afraid you were going to come out to me or maybe you were going to ask me for money. John's phone buzzes. <laughs> nah, still straight. And money's no issue for me. Oh, really? Uh, well, it's not something I talk about a lot, but you know how when you're texting on your phone? I'm familiar with the phenomenon. Mm, right. Well, like, you know how you use an emoji to either express an emotion or a joke or something? Yeah. I made an app that lets you personalize emojis based on an avatar that you designed to look like you that gets plugged into the app. So there's a cartoon of you rolling your eyes or making a kissy face or kicking a soccer ball or getting on a plane or relaxing on a beach with your buddy who's also customized. Anyway, I launched it myself and within a month, Snapchat drove a dump truck full of money to my house to buy it for me. And now I get a fraction of a penny every time someone sends a personalized snap emoji. <laughs> I know I don't trust it. <laughs> Tell you what, come to Palau, try it out. You hate it? We can go somewhere else. Or I can get you on a plane and you'll be back in Chicago in 48 hours. Leo. Come on. What are you so worried about? Your job? Your house plans? Don't tell me it's the saltwater crocodiles because they've only ever killed one person in Palau's history and that was in 1965. Okay, how about all of the above? Take a sabbatical, hire a gardener, avoid mangroves. Oh. And hey, I checked. They decriminalized gay sex five years ago, so you're totally in the clear. Leo, you know why I can't go with you. You remember the last time we saw each other? That New Year's party at Jocelyn's, you were back home for Christmas break? God, barely, but yeah. You downed a whole bottle of Malibu on a dare, and then we went out back to make snow angels like idiots, and... After lying in the snow for a while, you got up, pulled off your shirt, and ran off into the ravine howling like a lunatic. I eventually found you, face down, passed out in the snow. Your skin was so blue, I thought you had frostbite, but it was just the moonlight. I picked you up and carried you back to the house with your arm over my shoulder. You remember what you said to me? No. Uh, he said, don't ever leave me, Leo. I couldn't bear it. And then you kissed me. And I kind of laughed and you laughed and then you slipped your hand up my shirt, your fingers still so cold. They felt like peppermint mouthwash, you know how it burns and tingles on your tongue. And you grabbed a clump of my chest hair and pulled me into you and you- John's phone rings and snaps him out of the daydream. John doesn't answer it. I didn't know what to say. I mean, you're the one who moved off for school while I was still living at home with my parents. Leo? You'd gone to Chicago and you'd made all these other friends and 
even when you were back home, it seemed like you were in some other planet's orbit. You were already talking about law school in California. So I guess I kind of let you go. And you did. If you ever wanted something you just can't have, Lee. My doc says I can't have bacon anymore. You know, it's funny. I wanted to keep in touch with you. And I had wished you had come to Chicago with me back then. Well, maybe it would have made a difference. Maybe I needed to try harder too. I never found that again, a friendship like ours. I mean, I'm not a hermit. I'm pretty active in the Minneapolis LARPing community and I'm successful, but here I am, 30, bored, single, comparing myself to the person I thought I'd be when I was 15 and trying to convince myself that this is just as good, if not better, than being a globe-trotting ninja astronaut with three platinum albums. <laughs> Do you think that you hold up to your teenage expectations? I was so screwed up at 15, Lee. John's phone rings and he ignores it. I do have one favorite memory though. It was the night at summer camp in Wisconsin when we uh, both snuck away to look at the stars. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that, you perv. It was your idea. And you're the one who snuck in the Playboy. Nice one, if I remember, by the way. <laughs> so now it's uh, your turn to make me uncomfortable. But it's not just that. Um, we stayed up together almost all night watching the sky change and talking about what we were gonna do after high school. And I told you about how I never really wanted to go to school, that I wanted to build furniture and write sci-fi, but I didn't think I had the talent. How I was scared that I was gonna end up like my dad. There was some other stuff too. That was probably the most honest night of my entire childhood and I was still lying to myself about most of it. God, that was half our lifetimes ago now. Are you still lying now? I never lie anymore. You know, in Palau, we'll see those stars again. Well, different stars because we're at a different latitude, but they'll be so in Intensely bright because the nearest city will be a thousand miles away. And we won't be a couple of 15 year olds on camp rules. John's phone rings again and he ignores it. You're a terrible influence. You're thinking about it. Leo, I'm sorry. Look, let's get out of here. Let's go grab a beer. Let's go really catch up somewhere. No. <laughs> No, I'm going to go to Palau and then maybe Zanzibar and the Amazon. It's, it's my last chance. We're getting old. Are you mad at me? This was a mistake. I, I shouldn't have bothered you. I, I'm crazy. I'm going to go. Keep the ticket. It, it's non-refundable anyway, but I think you can use the flight credit. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look, look, we're going to see each other at the wedding tomorrow. We're going to keep in touch. Yeah, maybe we'll do coffee when we're 40. Leo leaves. John looks at the print out in front of him. His phone buzzes. He goes to answer it, then decides to ignore it. He looks at the paper again. Leo, hey, wait up. End of play. Thanks everyone. Um, I wanted to, uh, before we go into our Q&A, thank all of our amazing actors. Um, 
We'd like to start with the first play, Stephen Oakey, Danette Sills, Guy Dumphy. Second play, Noah Seagard, Todd Pivetti. Uh, final play, Bryce Townsend and John Reeser. Thank you so much. Uh, great job, everyone. And to thank our directors, of course, Christopher Basile, Marty Madden, and Matt Cogswell. <laughs> I think I got everyone. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, what we're going to do today is I'm going to uh, introduce the playwrights, uh, and we'll do a Q&A in the order that the plays are presented. Um, we're going to ask at this point that you keep your questions to the content of the plays itself. And if we um, have time at the end, we'll address other concerns that you might have about Zoom performances, the current state of theater, current state of the world, anything else. But before I do that, I want to announce our program uh, for Sunday, October 11th, um, which is going to be at uh, 4 p.m. Mountain Time, going back to our regular time. And uh, the plays will be One Great Big Light by David Mariello, who's in Wakefield, Massachusetts, directed by Matt Cogswell in Clinton, Massachusetts. Um, Perseids by Andrea Hunt, on, excuse me, Andra Hunter in Dallas, Texas, directed by Nicole Moeller, who is in New York, starring Nicole, Nicole Moeller and Megan Greener, also in New York. And finally, The Last Great Act of Mankind by Scott Sickles in New York, directed by Jonathan Liebman, also in New York with a cast very soon to be announced. Um, so uh, I would love to introduce uh, Larry Wrinkle. Larry, I know that I saw you uh, log on, so we'd love to uh, have you all. And if you all want to turn your cameras on at this point to join the discussion, uh, certainly feel free. Um, Larry's uh, full-length play uh, about a talented Jewish piano student was awarded best play at the Secret Theater's 2017 Unfritch Festival and received its Long Island premiere in December of 2019. Uh, his other produced plays include adaptations from Chaucer and Dante, a farce about gender blind casting in Shakespeare, and several mostly gay romantic comedies and several one minute plays. That's becoming a somewhat new thing now. Larry, mm -hmm. great to have you here. Um, Thank you. There you are. Yes. Beautiful, nice background, good job. Yeah. <laughs> um, Larry, is it all right if I read the dedication that you wrote in the play? Of course, truly. Yeah, because I'd like, I think we, you know, we didn't get to read it in the performance, but it was, you know, it seems to be more appropriate to read it now. Um, the play is written in, in fond memory of Brian Frederick Klimkowski of Island Trees High School in Levittown, New York, class of 1966. After high school, I never saw Brian again, but he took an, uh, an MA in creative writing from Stanford University in 1972. As best I can tell, Brian died in San Francisco during the mid 1980s though I don't know if he was gay or died from AIDS. According to worldcat.org, the only copy of his MA thesis, Migrations, outside Stanford is held by the library of the U University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. I've only seen a few of the poems and they're brilliant. Could you talk about how you came upon Brian's work? Well, um, I, I was just um, surfing the net to find um, high school classmates I hadn't seen forever. Okay. And um, I ran across one of his poems and so in trying to track him down, eventually uh, the Social Security Death Index for California revealed his name, having died in 1984. And that's about all I know. I don't know, I don't know his history outside that. What, what drew you to his work that inspired you to write the, this play about him? Well, he, he was really a very gifted poet. Um, uh, I was really surprised um, by the level of achievement in the few poems I've seen. So I would love to track down that um, thesis myself. Um, and I tried tra going to Stanford, asking if they would send me a copy and that was not uh, feasible. So uh, whether I would go to Sao Paulo myself is dubious. Okay, well, we um, I can let Matt talk in a minute about this, but um, one of the things he's brought up in rehearsal was, um, you know, the line, you know, I'm a victim. I'm sorry, I don't remember the line exactly of, um, you know, Ronald Reagan's 1980s America, mm -hmm. and uh, we're certainly now faced in a sort of similar time now, <laughs> where we're dealing with a different kind of pandemic, where there's an administration. Sorry to talk politics that maybe isn't always on our side in terms of the people, and I'm just curious um, how that sort of theme ties into 
the content of the player, the story of the player, the characters, um, what it, um, how it, how, how you think it plays out in the passions, particularly of the old man, and what it says about him and his connection to that period of time. Do you want me to respond? I would love for you to respond. Sure. Well, <laughs> the real, the real Brian Klimkowski, that was his actual name. This yeah. That I think I'm free to use it. Um, was nothing at all like the character I created. Um, Brian is a Brian is a composite of several people as well as a fictional um, ghost, obviously. Um, and I decided to create him as something of a snarky bully mm -hmm. um, who, um, at least during his high school period, um, was dishonest not only to those around him but to himself and perhaps um, in the intervening years found who he really was and uh, died of AIDS in the mid 80s. Now, I don't know if that was true of the real Brian or not. Um, okay. but, um, I decided to leave that um, illusion on, on um, explain because I think many people would be able to pick up on it. Well, it gives us a lot of insight into uh, Brian's character and uh, mm -hmm. creates a, you know, so what we do as playwrights is we come up with an idea and then of course invent, invent some of the backstory right. to make it work in the, in the narrative, which you did, you did brilliantly. I know this play has been, has given, has had many productions. Um, Several, yes. uh, looks like the, the village playwrights, we actually did a play a few, uh, a few weeks ago that was also done in the village playwrights uh, reading series, which has been mm -hmm. around forever and has been a great uh, source for seeing them. Um, LGBTQ play, new, new plays. Um, uh, so great. Um, we look forward to seeing your next work. Um, you yeah, Actually, you, um, it's yeah. getting another Zoom production yes. in a couple oh, of Oh, yes. Yes, in New York. It's right. going to be published in an uh, anthology of Long Island writers. Um, That's great. So I love that there is an anthology of Long Island writers. That's so cool. <laughs> um, Matt, I would love to hear, uh, Matt, our, our director, um, your uh, reasons for wanting to direct this play when I sent it to you. Are you still with us? I'm, I'm here. Here you are. Hi. Um, well, Larry, it's just a beautiful script to begin with. And I, I think it speaks to that idea of that lost love that we, we wish we could see and that we wish we could talk to. And when I worked with my actors, it was just about finding that. Here's that opportunity to speak to someone that you haven't been able to speak to. And, and what do you say? And what do you do in that moment? And, and I had a great cast to work with. So Definitely. thank you. <laughs> um, Guy, we'd love to hear from you, uh, particularly your thoughts about Brian, particularly based on what Larry said and your, your uh, connection with him while you were working on this? Um, yeah, well, it's just, it's, you know, it's not something I've done before. I haven't had the opportunity to play a person who isn't alive, so that was very <laughs> interesting. Um, and, you know, I I personally, I relate to, because the way I see the character is his snarkiness is, it's a defense mechanism. Um, and I, you know, I myself, you know, I sometimes will use humor in a situation to, deflect if need be. Um, and so I, that was something that I was able to really relate to. Um, and then also the line that you mentioned, Aaron, look where I am now, dead at 36 in Ronald Reagan's America. Um, it's a very poignant line because I don't know, it speaks to, as an individual, there's almost a sense of being powerless, especially in comparison thinking about like the government or a president um, that doesn't seem to be listening to the people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's, I think it's a really powerful line. Um, if not the most powerful line in the scene. Yeah, my exactly. Mind. It really jumps out. It jumps out at me when I read it. I'm like, oh, I get it <laughs> in a whole other way. Great, uh, Danette, let's hear from you about uh, you had a lot of fun playing the librarian, I could tell. Are you still there, Jeanette? She's on mute. Oh, she's on mute. Okay. I'm now, I'm now unmuted. Yeah. Thank uh, you. The librarian was a lot of fun. What I was trying to find was some kind of uh, hook, not just a hook, but a, a base for the character, because otherwise she's just some um, very basic uh, two-dimensional 
uh, comic relief, yeah. so to speak. And I think she does feel that there is an importance why this man is standing in front of her trying, mm -hmm. you know, diligently to get into the library and find this particular piece of work. And she's a librarian. If she's a d dedicated librarian, then she is going to understand that a piece of work means something to somebody. And it is more than just words on a page, in, uh, in a book or on the page. It's something that speaks to them. And then she, at the end, has tried to go ahead and find this and, and diligently spent her time because she didn't need to go look for the book. And uh, it, was, it was interesting trying to find that, that basis. Um, and the other thing was trying to find a, an accent that was not over the top. And I'll be completely honest, is that uh, the accent that came to mind is Ricardo Mantelbaum. <laughs> Which, because he was in her explanations, that she's very, you know, specific. So that's all I could hear in my head. And I think I mentioned that to you. Eric. You did. That was the first thing I think you said. I'm like, great, go with it. So, you know? um, but uh, you know, Wrath of Khan as well. But um, so I, I really enjoyed the play. I think it's it's a lovely, lovely piece. And I do hope, Mr. Wrinkle, that you get to Sao Paulo and find that <laughs> library. <laughs> but library is a little, little nicer, perhaps. <laughs> Absolutely. OK, Stephen, are you still with us? I'm here. Excellent. Um, in an actual library, it looks like. Yeah. So you're, you, you look like a ghost a little bit yourself right now. Your, your head is sort of fading in and out. So yeah, what, what, was, uh, what was it like for you playing this character in connection to particularly what Brian, uh, sorry, what Larry was talking about, um, a little bit about the history of of Brian and the context, the relationship, et cetera. Well, it was it was great fun because I think you can always find bits of your own life that you can you can draw upon. And so it made me think about, hmm, you know, people that I haven't seen in a long time or and what would it be like to, you know, reconnect with them. And I can't say that I have exactly that personal experience. However, it was um I really en enjoyed doing I like the script a lot because it it it, even though it was rather brief, it, it gave a lot of opportunity to, you know, express, you know, the, the, the old man's frustration and, you know, the desire to really find this book and reconnect with what was really his, you know, perceived lost love. Yeah. It was fun. Excellent. Um, thank you all. Um, we're just going to take one or two questions if there are any. And if you do have questions, if you want to uh, use the hand raise function under participants, and I'll I'll see if there are any raised hands. Philip does. Philip, hi, 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 uh, hi, Larry. Good to see you again. Um, you too, Phil. It's been a year. Uh, I just wanted to say that, Larry, a, a year ago I saw your uh, the reading of the semicolon is a double at Midwest Dramatists. Mm -hmm. And it was extremely moving. And I think that there's a connection between these plays in, in, in a way that you have in semicolon, you've got the beginning of a relationship, I think, I hope. And in this one, you've, you've, you're, you're in sort of a different phase of that kind of a relationship between those two, those two characters. Is, it, was that, is, there a, is there a connection or is that just the way you write? Uh, I don't know um, if there was specifically, um... I mean, this is one of perhaps um, half a dozen gay themed plays I've written. Um, and there was another one involving a ghost for that matter. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would say that um, the semicolon is sort of like an ideal fantasy of a, a perfect day where two boys come and find each other. And this one is sort of um, in its way, um, um, an unexpected, unrequited um, lost love turns out to have worked out more favorably and than the old man could have ever expected. He gets he gets the book. He finds Brian's true feelings, which Brian could only communicate through that poem. Yeah. And he leaves fulfilled. Thank you. It was a beautiful play. I loved reading it and I loved hearing it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just to give a quick shout out, Philip, uh, Philip's play, uh, Last Exit, we'll be doing at the end of October. So we'll look forward to seeing Great. him back. Uh, Candace, Candace Perry. Hello there from Welsh. Hi, Candace. Good to see you. Hi, hi. Yeah. Good to see you. Um, 
I love, love short plays, but the only thing I notice, because I write a lot of them, is that sometimes if you, if you miss one little fraction, then maybe you missed it. So what I maybe missed, maybe it was in there, is did the librarian know all along she had the book in her drawer? No. <laughs> okay. No. Because it just happened to have been there. No, Brian, Brian himself checked it out okay. um, and kept it in the desk. But he didn't tell the old man because no. no. he's kind of snarky, right? He didn't <laughs> tell the old man until it was safe um, and the librarian had left the room to uh, set up, set the, uh, okay. the alarms. That, that, wor that works. Okay, good. I just wanted to be sure I hadn't... <laughs> That's what I thought, but I thought, did I miss? Did I miss something? Thank you. I really, really enjoyed it, and I thought I thought it worked great as a ten minute because the Excellent. whole thing was was in there. Thank you. It's amazing the richness that you can in a story that you can tell in that that short amount of time. So, well, listen, we're going to move on. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, we hope to see more of you <laughs> and to stay in touch. So, great. We're going to move on to our next play of kind and kindness. Um, Jerome Joseph Gentis. Uh, received his BA in English from UC Berkeley and an MFA in nonfiction writing from Columbia University. He started writing plays in earnest in 2012 with deve developmental readings of his full-length play, Hold Your Peace at the Playwright Center of San Francisco in June 2012, and then in September of 2013 at the United Artists Theater in Buffalo. Um, his shorter works appeared on stages around the Bay Area in various stages of development. Um, his writings have appeared in many magazines. I'm just going to read a few of them. Out.com, uh, the San Francisco uh, Bay Guardian, uh, Publishers Weekly, uh, and many others. Uh, Jerome, great to see you. There you are. Good to be here. Thanks. Hi. I know that you're not muted, but you're... Uh, we don't see you on the screen yet, at least I don't, but that's okay, we'll keep talking. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Um, cool. Jerome, uh, tell me about your connection to Twelfth Night. <laughs> it's pretty old and I'm pretty There deep. you are. <laughs> um, my, um, it's actually a play, I uh, when I was too young to know what, um, Shakespeare was. Um, my dad and I went to a nearby park and we stumbled upon a local outdoor theater production. We didn't know what it was. In fact, it looked like a circus more than anything else. And it was, it, I realized years later, it was Twelfth Night. We had come into it be, you know, before, it, after it started, but the whole play was so funny. I like, that, that production is still planted in my mind and I can still see like how they staged, you know, the bay windows and stuff like that. So when I grew older and, you know, had to read Shakespeare in high school and stuff like that, um, my um, English teacher at Westmont High School in Campbell, California, Don Chase, um, assigned us Twelfth Night to read. And I remember that the Antonio Sebastian homoeroticism she brought to our attention mm. And this is, you know, long enough ago that that wouldn't have been, <laughs> that was not on the syllabus really. You know? <laughs> it was kind of like, um, and you know, of course I was like, oh, that's very interesting. And, you know, taking note of the different reactions to it. Um, and I think if you know Twelfth Night, uh, it's very clear that something extraordinary has happened to these two characters prior to their appearance in Shakespeare's play. I think we all can tease out what happened and I wanted to know how they got to what happened. Interesting. So we, we I think in rehearsal, Marty, uh, the director said something about it being a prequel. Would you consider that? It's sort of like the backstory almost of their relationship. Yeah, this is actually an assignment from, um, so I'm a member of Playground uh, SF, which is oh, a yeah. playwrights incubator up here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And uh, as part of the writer's pool, they pitch out topics for their series called Monday Night Playground. And the first, or the, whatever this was, it was called the Shakespeare prequels. And we had to do exactly oh, that. Wow. Take a Shakespeare play or, or whatever and write a prequel to it. And uh, I knew right away, like, ah, now I get to like <laughs> write that scene. Um, <laughs> I've always wanted to hear from these two characters. So Marty, thanks, beautiful job. Um, it was great to see and hear again. Yeah, and I, you know, your master of, of the language was remarkable. 
I mean, listening to it now, it's, it, I felt like I was listening to Twelfth Night. I mean, it was really, really uh, very, very eloquent and sort of perfectly captured the, the uh, atmosphere and the relationship uh, by, you know, being in, you know, being authentic to, uh, to Shakespeare. So, thank um, you. Uh, great. So, Marty, let's bring you in. Uh, Marty Madden, director. Um, you uh, you're a, you know, professional Shakespearean actor yourself. You've been in. I've seen you in many heavy Shakespeare parts, and I'm curious about how uh, how how you felt about this and and you know took to it. You know, being your your history. Yeah, well, the, I mean, obviously the first thing reading it that really jumps out is the language and how deftly Jerome was able to uh, handle it. It feels like a prequel that could be actually appear in the play. And um, we were very lucky to have Todd and Noah who are very uh, experienced and uh, trained, well-trained uh, actors and Shakespearean actors at that um, to handle the language. So I, I didn't even, by the time we got into rehearsal a bit, I didn't, the language just felt very natural and very, because they were able to handle it and bring it to that. Um, but when I first read it, I'm like, oh, this might be kind of challenging to, um, to stage. And, it, and it's weird too, because it's Zoom. So you're not staging it. And that, that was pretty much the, the biggest challenge in, in dealing with, um, it's, it's all the language and you know a little bit of you know picture but even having i think there's a terrific job of being able to listen to each other and interact and, and yeah. feed off of each other um but it's so dependent on the language and i think it was very successful because of the language so great job jerome glad to meet you <laughs> great well we're getting to meet each other a little bit through this for format so uh let's uh, bring up noah are you still with us did he leave the call um, and Todd, are you still on the call as well? I'm here. Here you are. Let's, uh, I know you, you've worked with a drone before, correct? Yes, uh, a couple different readings. Okay. Um, what was it like working for you with the language, you know, with this backstory in mind, you know, coming up with your own interpretation? Um, well, I, um, I think I, I told, you know, our little team this, but I have not, uh, really acted at all in like five years. So it was all a bit of a shock to me at first to uh, <laughs> step back into uh, uh, that kind of language and, you know, reading out loud mm -hmm. in a sense. And um, uh, so, yeah, that was kind of my biggest hurdle that I had to, to get over. But I think Jerome writes with, uh, um, with actors in mind. Uh, he writes really um, freely, but everything mm -hmm. kind of flows really, really nicely. And something that Marty brought up that um, I thought was really cool was that there's probably like 10 little mini plays within the short play yeah. that were in there that, um, you know, made it really fun and challenging as an actor to be able to find the tactic and get the objective very quickly and then move on to the next one. And I right. thought that was really smart from uh, Jerome and uh, very well directed by Marty. He helped us out a lot. Great, excellent. Good to hear. Do we have any questions uh, for Jerome or any of the actors or actor, I should say, or Marty? Um, this was done, there, there was another Zoom production of this done recently, wasn't there? Uh, there's going to be actually. There's going to be, okay. Well, I'm glad yeah. we were first. <laughs> I'm glad you were too. Set <laughs> <laughs> a high bar. Okay, good, yes. Uh, we're, we're lucky to have such great actors that are a uh, resource and directors, so. Uh, great, well, thank you, Jerome. Um, we hope to see you back and um, keep in touch. Thank you. Excellent. Um, last but certainly not least, Rob Salerno um, is a, a writer of Pal Palau, I had to catch myself, is a writer, actor, and journalist based in Los Angeles, California, and Toronto. Um, he's been honored with nominations for the Door Award in Canada. Um, he was once labeled a theatrical rabble rouser by the Globe and uh, Mail's theater, uh, theater critic. In Los Angeles, uh, he's one of the producers of Mike Pence's Big Queer Nightmare, a monthly sketch show at O West spotlighting queer writers, actors, and comedians. Um, 
He, his original plays have been, uh, have been in more than 30 cities across Canada and around the world. Um, he's been published in Vice Magazine, The Advocate, National Post, Metro Toronto, Now Magazine, and many others. And is also a commenter on CTV and the Sun News Network. Um, it's been uh, great to have you back, Rob. Rob directed one of our earlier readings, um, uh, Switching Sides, a couple months ago, and it's great to have you to see your work. Um, I've been looking forward to producing this play, for, you know, since you submitted it. And uh, so I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on why Micronesia, <laughs> how that connects, what, what, what that means to you in your life and how, how you thought of it in terms of the context of the story. Um, you know, honestly, I, um, uh, the destination, I don't feel like uh, is entirely important. Mm -hmm. um, it really came out uh, just of this idea of um, these, these things that we want that are really far away and hard to get to. Um, or that we that we once wanted and we we've let slip away uh, as we've uh, gotten older and, and taken on other responsibilities or other opportunities. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I can tell you the, the reason I, I, I picked Palau as uh, the, the destination in this was uh, literally as I was writing it, uh, Palau in 2014 decriminalized gay sex. And I just thought that was oh. a, a funny um, uh thing to, to, to work into the script. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I've, I've done a little bit of research about um, uh, laws uh, around the world that uh, criminalize uh, homosexuality. And uh, a lot of them, in, in a lot of countries, these are uh, legacies of British colonialism mm. uh, in, in these, uh, these different territories. And uh, because many states in Micronesia, Polynesia, and, and Oceania generally um, uh, were colonized by the British, by America. Um, uh, the United States was actually the, the last uh, colonial possessor of Palau. Um, they inherited these laws and uh, these states are slowly um, getting rid of these, uh, these things. And I, I just thought that, that was an interesting thing to, to highlight about a country that I, I think most people don't know a lot about. No, I certainly didn't myself. So it was, I, you know, when I was looking, you know, looking it up, I, I was like, oh, okay, I get it. Something I certainly would have thought about before. It's interesting to look at your play in contrast to Jerome's play, because they're both about dealing with, you know, masculine identity and sexuality when it's not sort of an overt identity. They sort of grapple with their feelings for each other in this kind of coverted way. And I'm, I'm curious about how you felt about that in your story about these two characters that might be gay, might not be gay, might be, you know, it's not really clear, but they're working out their feelings for each other, uh, nonetheless, in their intimacy, you know, establishing their int intimacy with each other, nonetheless, so. Um, I mean, you know, in, in my original, in my uh, writing of it, I approached it as John is gay, Leo is uh, uh, straight, mm -hmm. and they kind of lost touch years mm -hmm. ago when John, um, not because John came out of the closet, but you know, as they both sort of grew apart when John came out of the closet and moved to uh, the big city and, and uh, Leo stayed behind and um, they, they just sort of like found themselves doing different things and becoming different people and maybe not having a lot in common anymore. And then mm -hmm. uh, there's this, this thing where Leo just kind of like realizes he misses his old friend. And I mean, like I've, I've definitely had those moments with uh, people that I've missed from high school or people who reached out to me that, you know, you know, not to sound like a jerk, but like, you know, maybe I haven't thought of this person literally in 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think there's something interesting in that dynamic um, that isn't necessarily sexual, but may just be, um, uh, th there is a, a, a desire there, uh, a desire for companionship, for friendship, for uh, a form of love that is, you know, not, not necessarily sexual, but uh, mm -hmm. is, is still nonetheless very important. Well, I think exploring male intimacy that's not sexual is, you know, not something we see a lot. <laughs> And, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a challenging subject, and I thought you dealt with it uh, beautifully. And I, I should mention this, you adopted this as a short film, correct? Well, I, I know you did, because I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you can see it on YouTube, I think, right? Or... Uh, yeah, it's available on my YouTube channel, which yeah. is just at yeah. Rob Salerno. 
And if you do get a chance to see it, uh, Rob did, a, he's acting in it, but he did a beautiful job of adapting it for, for film and opening up in a way that I think it was quite beautiful, so. Thank you. Great, uh, great. I don't think Christopher, the director, are you on the call? It doesn't look like you are. Um, but I'd love to hear from Bryce and John, if you're still with us. John, I see you, so we'll start with you. Um, what was it like for you playing John, <laughs> your namesake? Um, yeah, I thought the play was very touching and also thought provoking because within mm -hmm. such a very brief, like concentrated moment between two people, between these two men, so many mm -hmm. layers get touched on. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought it was very challenging, but also very interesting to take what on the surface is just, you know, like maybe 10 minutes talking about whether or not we're going to go on a trip to Palau together it seems to unravel both of them in ways where my character, I feel especially like there's this push pull. I, I definitely want to feel something. Mm. I'm really excited to see you, but I definitely don't want to feel this. Mm. I'm not entirely sure I'm ready to go there, but please take me there. And that just feels so normal. So human, like that's very real um, that, um, just moments, encounters between people who've had really close relationships when they come back together after a period of time, it can just kind of hit you like a bell. And I felt like my character was aware that he was ringing inside emotionally mm -hmm. and not always entirely sure what to do with it. And um, I kind of liked the way that nothing is all tidily and neatly resolved and wrapped up in a little bow because also that felt more gratifying, that felt more real, more human. Well, and that push and pull you talked about is what makes great theater, right? So <laughs> it's great, great, great material. Bryce, uh, how about for you? Um, Rob, I love what you said. That's a whole like curveball for me. I, I had uh, decided that, that Leo was gay, um, but it's a f more fascinating piece, I think, if it is an exploration of intimacy and affection between two men who aren't both necessarily gay. Um, and Aaron, like you said, that's, a, that's an area that is really sensitive and can be very uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, John, yes, if it's not like in a bow and if it's not, we're clearly defined and I'm this and you're this too, so we can do that. But, you know, there's, there's love and feelings and heart and, and when we're children, when we're growing up, before all of these rules and you know societal norms shape us and can sort of box us in, we have that freedom. And so I just thought this piece was um, such a really heartwarming um, you know opportunity to have ten minutes to whether Leo's gay and John's the one who got away and he wants to you know be with him romantically, or whether he just misses his friend and and this is a an adventure companion and um, you know it's a really beautiful uh, moment I think to just have that time at a coffee shop to convince someone to go run away to travel. I mean, you know who doesn't want that. Um, <laughs> So I just think it's a beautiful piece. I, I think it works great for Zoom. I mean, I'd love to watch the short film as well. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just so happy to have been a part of it. We had a really good team to collaborate and bring, to collaborate with and bring this bring this about. Yeah, and I'm sorry Christopher isn't here because I thought he did such great work with both of you the, for the one rehearsal I was at. And you and John really brought a lot of, uh, a lot of I think yourselves and also investigating into who these people are in a way that felt very rich and, and very intimate which is hard to do on Zoom, but you both, you know, I think we've been achieving it in the series and thanks to having people of your quality uh, here, it's been, it's been great. So great. Do we have any questions um, before we, uh, before we go? Um, Does that cat have a question? <laughs> oh, let's see. Is that no, I'm kidding. That's Phil, is that Phillips? Oh, here's De Danette. Oh, wait, we'll start with Bill uh, and then go to Danette. He said the cat. <laughs> oh, there, that's whose cat it is. Thank you. But he looks a little bit like he's morphing into something else. He, um, he does Bill, Bill, did you have a question? I'll try to unmute you. The cat will give praises while you get Bill. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Bill, Bill, uh, uh, you're Bill, you're unmuted. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to congratulate everyone. The three plays were wonderful um, and the acting and direction. Uh, my, my test is always if I forget, I'm sitting in a seat watching and I'm in the world of the story. And that happened in all three plays. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, the librarian. I thought that yeah. was your natural accent. <laughs> Good. No, and I'm afraid it is not, you know. <laughs> no, I was born in Chicago, so I'm pretty Midwestern. <laughs> and I love the librarian as a foil to the two guys. And uh, yeah, beautiful uh, Shakespeare feeling. Um, and the last play, I love that you left the audience to make, <laughs> you left us to make up our mind what happens. That's always fun. Just uh, congratulations, everyone. It's really beautiful work. And thank you, Aaron, for doing this. Oh, thank you for being so supportive of us, truly. And we hope to... I want to involve you, which we will at some point <laughs> before the end of the year. So thanks for thanks for being here again. Danette, did you have a question? I had more of a comment uh, going go back it. to the, go the uh, idea of male friendships yeah. and how it's very difficult to have two men express feelings for each other, that it's not a sexual relationship. I'm going to get a little emotional because it's the fifth anniversary of a good friend of ours having passed. Um, mm. And um, he was my husband's best friend and they had become friends as photographers. Uh, we traveled to Edinburgh, we traveled to um, Cuba and Peter and Mark uh, went to Cuba a few times and they were the closest that I could imagine two men could be. And it really hit me that uh, with this play that that's an important thing. You know, it is incredibly important thing for people to show how they care about each other. Sexuality, non-sexual, doesn't mm -hmm. matter. It's it's exactly. the spirit and the heart. That's it. Thank you, Danette. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, you know, plays like this do make us think about the own our own friendships, the people in our lives that are important to us. And uh, you know, going going back to what uh, Rob, uh, somebody, or it was Larry, I think, was saying about high school friends. You know, these people that are close to us and then we lose touch with them, but they're still close to us. We doesn't necessarily, they're not in our lives, but they remain in our, in our minds, our bodies, our spirits, our memories. So, um, uh, Philip, did you, you look yeah. like you have your hand up. Philip Williams. Just a real quick comment. I just found, I just found Rob Salerno's page on New Play Exchange. So I'm really looking forward to reading more of your yeah. work. I just love that this play was, uh, well, Aaron will know that there's a, I have a connection. I, I feel a connection with this play. Um, and it's really, it's really quite good. So I'm looking forward to reading your work, Rob. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning New Playwrights Exchange because, um, you know, I've been connecting with a lot of great writers through that and we've been sort of developing this little community. But in part, I started it by doing the series, but um, it's, it's a way for playwrights to connect with each other. So if you're a playwright and you're, you know, thinking of, or, or you're looking for a place to meet other playwrights and to have your work on there, other people can then read it and write comments. And it's been a really great resource for me, for my own work, but also in terms of doing the series. So um, great. Well, my goal was to end this at five, uh, 4.25 Mountain Time because sunset is in one minute and Yom Kippur is about to, to commence. So we are gonna end now um, out of respect. And I just wanted to thank everyone for being here and for you know sharing their time, their talents. Um, we hope to see you at the next event, October 11th, starting uh, an hour later than we did this time at 4 p.m. Mountain time, our usual start time. Uh, and um, I hope to work with all of, all of these wonderful playwrights, actors, and directors that were with us today. And for those that weren't participating but were in the audience, I hope to work with you as well again. So um, thanks everyone, signing off. Hope to see Thank you, you in June. Thanks. thanks everyone. Thank yeah. you, peace. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Aaron. Bye-bye.